Welcome, guys. Thanks for coming. Close call, MC. Thanks for having <laughs> us. Thanks for having us. Um, MC just rushed in the door, so thank you for coming. Both very busy people. Why don't we start with introductions? So MC is COO of Uniswap Labs. Devin is executive director of Uniswap yeah. Foundation. So we're going to get into the, the differences, you know, in, in focus and what you guys um, res do respectively, but it'd be awesome just to start with how you got here. So MC, do you want to start off with your background? Sure. So I spent about 15 years in what we now call TradFi uh, in crypto. So um, starting businesses in um, digital investing and uh, sustainable investing, I started a company myself that failed, and all along was passionate about crypto and felt very strongly that you had to rewrite the rails to really change the financial system. Um, little known fact, Devin and I actually sat near each other um, at BlackRock about seven, eight years ago. And so when I learned about Uniswap in 2020, I felt like it was the first application in the sort of nine years since I'd first bought Bitcoin in 2011, I'd been watching crypto. The first application that really like could change the, the financial system. And so found my way to joining the company when it was about eight people. Hi, um, I'm Devin Walsh. I'm the executive director of the Uniswap Foundation. Um, as MC mentioned, I, I actually started my career at, at BlackRock and got an up close and personal view into some of the frictions that exist with uh, traditional or TradFi rails. One of the things that inspired me initially actually to get into the crypto space. Um, back in around 2016, uh, 2017. Since then, I have worn a number of different hats prior to getting into the Uniswap world. So uh, conducting independent research while getting my grad degree at, at MIT, um, uh, doing some venture investing for, for a few years, also holding a number of leadership roles at, at crypto startups prior to becoming chief of staff at Uniswap Labs um, in, in uh, 2022. Um, and one of the things I did there was act as an ecosystem liaison. So working with other builders and folks kind of conducting research, doing a lot of interesting things outside of Uniswap Labs, um, kind of on their own, um, building, building on the protocol and really saw some early success cases that had grown out of programs like the Uniswap Grants Program and saw a huge opportunity to really scale up and add more structure and strategy to that kind of work, again, outside of labs. So um, I, a little bit more than a year ago, stepped away from Uniswap Labs, spent some time getting to know a lot of folks really closely in the community, and that ultimately led me to founding the foundation, which has led me here today. I think the backstory that's interesting, like Uniswap actually has a, a lot, like a big role in Variant's origin story, um, which in short is Uniswap, I, f I first met Hayden, the, f the founder CEO, um, I don't know, 2017 or 18 when he was first working on the project. I was at Andreessen Horowitz at the time, and I was really, really excited about, about AMMs as this sort of new idea. Um, and really pounded the table to lead the investment while at Andreessen. Andreessen being a bigger fund, didn't, didn't do that. Um, and so I thought, well, somebody needs to launch a fund that's dedicated to seed investing. And so that was part of the initial spark for Variant. And we were, we were investors in the subsequent round that happened um, thereafter and, and have been very, you know, been, it's been super fun and super informative to be involved in the journey, in, you know, from the beginning to um, to today, where the foundation has recently spun out and is doing a lot of great work alongside labs. So, okay, so that, that with intros out of the way, let's talk a little bit about the, the split between foundations and labs and what the respective focus is for the, for the company and for the foundation, which is a nonprofit. So, MC, why don't, why don't you start? What, what's, what's labs focused on today? Sure. So the uh, the simplest way I think I describe the distinction is that if um, SMTP is, uh, is the protocol for email and Gmail is a simple application on top of it that makes it accessible and intuitive, Labs is focused on building the Gmail application. Um, and we're certainly not the only one. There are many, many other companies that are building applications and products that make access to the Uniswap protocol um, and other parts of, of DeFi in the crypto ecosystem simple and safe. So we're mostly focused on um, consumers, on consumers who might want to um, swap uh, tokens. Uh, we built a self-custody wallet, a mobile wallet, um, and a web application. Uh, and we're all, we also now are building um, APIs that will serve enterprise customers. 
Um, but uh, in that analogy, uh, the Uniswap protocol is a lot more complexity and breadth and depth than SMTP. And so um, to make it truly a developer platform and unlock the many things that it can make possible, um, we, we as one company can't do that. We can't do that alone. And so um, uh, there were many times in 2021, I think, when, in 2022, where there was enthusiasm about how much could be done on top of the protocol, and Labs was not equipped to really deliver on that. We, don't ha we didn't have the resources. We're just one team. We have to drive focus. Um, and so that's part of why I think the existence of the foundation has really helped the whole ecosystem grow. And frankly, we see them as very like synergistic. So the more people are building the protocol, the more liquidity there is, the more users, the more awareness, the better it is for our products. And yeah, ju just to kind of like piggyback off of that a little bit, I think that the missions of both organizations are, you know, very aligned and very, very similar. We, we both exist in order to build digital financial infrastructure that is accessible, that is transparent, that is provably fair, that anyone can use and anyone can build upon. Um, MC just covered what uh, Uniswap Labs focus is for the foundation where um, a nonprofit grant making organization. We have a $30 million budget to make grants over at least the next two years to focus on seeding, funding, supporting the developer ecosystem. Again, kind of external to, to labs. Uh, funding researchers, um, developing you know innovations upon how to improve the user experience on top of, of the protocol, and also investigating and doing development into ways that um, stakeholders in the protocol can really step into the value that it creates to align interests with, with the protocol. And um, I think, as, as MC mentioned, I think all of those things that we do are very complementary to, to one another and ultimately build upon one another. One thing that's, that's interesting is how the foundation actually came into existence. I think it's it's sort of atypical, the, the story of the Uniswap Foundation, especially relative to other foundations in the space. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So I, I kind of touched on it in, in my intro bit. So while I was at Uniswap Labs, one of the things that I did was kind of field, you know, questions, queries from developers in the ecosystem to kind of think through how, how we could support them or at least answer developer questions. And through that work and through getting to know my, my ultimately co-founder, Ken, at the Uniswap Grants Program, um, I saw I saw some early success cases and, you know, the, the inkling of something really special within the ecosystem in the way of teams that had received grants to work on research that ultimately went on to receive external VC funding. Again, this is to build different applications, different interfaces to Uniswap Labs um, that um, could, you know, generate VC style returns and really interesting new business models on top of Uniswap um, that were different to what labs had been building. And I saw an opportunity to scale up and again, provide more structure, organization, and ultimately strategy around where that funding could go to ultimately build a really strong ecosystem, um, true ecosystem around the protocol. As MC mentioned, you know, if Web3, if the next gen of the internet is made up of protocols and digital assets, Uniswap will be the liquidity layer. There is not going to just be one application built on top of that. There will be thousands, tens of thousands of different applications and interfaces serving different jurisdictions, different kinds of asset classes, different kinds of users. And the foundation is really the organization, or I see it as the organization that will seed a lot of the, the best developers, the best people today to build that future. And critically, I think the foundation was incepted by Uniswap token holders, right? So this is, I think, important to note, you know, a lot of projects in the space when they launch, um, they they form a nonprofit foundation. When I say they, I mean you know folks who are working at the the original you know for profit companies spin out and set up a foundation. In this case, it happened a little later on, right? So Labs existed for I don't know four, three four years before the foundation existed, and you know Labs went through the the process of progressively decentralizing the protocol, turning it over to the community, launching a token, and then. The token holders voted to, you know, fund the Uniswap Foundation. I think that's kind of an interesting detail, and just yeah, just curious if if, if any view on sort of on on the pro the mer the pros or cons or of taking that approach. Yeah, I, I can kind of speak to that first. I think um, you know the, this model we're building the building the playbook as we go. Um, this is really a, a, a new world that that we're facing. Um, ultimately, you know, while. 
other the, the other models in the space kind of launch the foundation at, at the point of you know token launching. Um, I think there there are a lot of benefits to the manner in which we start. You know, our goal is to generate kind of a, a DNA, a, a soul for Uniswap that is uh, represents like a growth and um, an, an evolution of, of what the DNA was and, and started with with Hayden and, and Labs. And I think we wouldn't be able to do that if the team was kind of a, a split of, of the founding team or an entirely new. Um, or our team represents some really amazing folks, but all coming from the community itself. And our continued funding, sustenance, ability to serve the community is tied to the community's, you know, continued buy-in to, to our mission, buy-in to our strategy and success. We rely upon them for funding, I guess, um, just to, to put it like that. And, and um, you know, while, while I think there are certainly trade-offs to, to that strategy um, or that playbook and that approach, I think ultimately it sets us up and it sets Uniswap up, most importantly, for long-term success. So let's look forward now. So I guess succinctly, like, what does success look like for labs and the foundation, respectively? And MC, why don't you go first? Sure. Well, we actually turned on revenue and fees this week for the first time. So success for us. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty excited. <laughs> Um, success for us means people, more and more people keep using our products and pay to use our products. Um, so that, that, uh, and that there, we think there are three big barriers to that right now. The first is simple wallets, that wallets, self-custody wallets are too hard to use, not that intuitive to sort of grow the, uh, the population and people for whom they're interesting and uh, compelling. Um, the second is more and more assets that are on chain. So um, the next version of the protocol V4 uh, will allow lots more customization that will uh, support real world assets. And we hope um, the foundation is doing so much work to help make sure it's a developer ecosystem for that. So what labs will do is hope to make that accessible and easy. We'll be competing with many other companies to do that um, more than ever uh, because they've been backed by grants from the foundation. But for success for us is really just building a, a, a strong, um, consu largely consumer um, facing brand uh, and being a revenue generating company. Yeah, and when it comes to the foundation, you know, I, I mentioned building an ecosystem, and I think that the the reason we're focused on that is because the the impact of building a strong ecosystem will be um, the creation of extremely strong network effects around the protocol. Now, kind of zeroing in on, on what exactly that means when you look at the incremental developer or developer team deciding where to build when they're looking at at Uniswap, they're getting not only provably fair, credibly neutral infrastructure upon which to build, they're also getting, you know, the the state, the the liquidity that is kind of stateful within the protocol that they benefit from and are able to build on because it is permissionless infra infrastructure. Now, those two things are, are pretty attractive for for folks to build on. I think the attractiveness of building on Uniswap is enhanced by Uniswap v4, which MC has mentioned, I think we'll, we'll get into in, in a bit. Um, it increases the ability to customize the user experience. Um, but as those interface now, interfaces and applications build, if they are successful, that represents obviously success for that team, um, the ability to you know, generate revenue for themselves. It also represents benefits to others across the ecosystem. There's net new organic order flow that you know, adds to the virtuous you know, positive flywheel effects, more net new organic order flow, more liquidity provided, et cetera. Better user experience um, for net new developers coming into the ecosystem for labs um, for every other developer. And so I would say that ability to create an ecosystem that is accretive to those network effects is really key for us. Yeah, if, if anyone out here is on crypto Twitter, you might have seen that this the announcement of labs turning on fees, it caused a little bit of a stir. Um, you know, just m my view is that, and, and Devin, I think you both touched on this, having sustainable companies building on top of protocols is, is not a zero sum game, right? It's like you need, you need the companies that are building on top of protocols to have a way to sustain themselves that's not sort of, that's market driven, right? So you, you guys earn fees at labs, you sustain the business, that's great. And that's ultimately good for the protocol because you, you integrate the protocol and drive liquidity to it and the network effects in the protocol to get other developers to do the same. And so it's, it's, it's a positive sum game. Yeah, I would say from from our perspective, you know, I think sustainable protocols will be made up of organizations and companies that themselves can be can be sustainable. 
Um, but that does not, I guess, preclude um, the protocol and stakeholders within the protocol from being able to step into the value that is created within the protocol itself to align interests with the protocol. And that's, that's definitely a focus area for the foundation and a priority for us. Sometimes because we use different words in crypto, it sounds like we're inventing everything for the first time. And, and the notion of having like a profitable network that has returns to the participants in it, and then companies that build software or products on top of that network is not necessarily novel, right? Like you can think of Visa and point of sale systems or credit cards as like an example um, of an ecosystem. You can think of the New York Stock Exchange and all the market makers around it and the members that are participants in that. So and there are lots of different analogies where maybe the value accrual happens in different parts and different at uh, different levels, but ultimately there are many examples where there's lots of different um, ecosystems like this. And taking a step back, Devin said this already, but if we're if we're both successful, hopefully there's um, much cheaper, more accessible financial infrastructure that unlocks universal ownership in a way that's different. Yeah, and I, very simply put, I see it as labs creates value for end users, and there's you know great products create lots of value for end users. Step into some of that value, of course, it makes sense. The foundation and the protocol create value for developers. Labs is one of them, right? And if there's a lot of value created there in the form of network effects and or otherwise you can step into the flow of that value too. So that anyway, that's for, you know, the crypto Twitter noise is, is loud, but I think it's, it's actually very simple. Um, okay, so we touched, you guys touched on Unis Uniswap v4, and there's been, there's been really a lot of milestones this year. There's been, you know, the wallet at labs, um, which is, you know, on mobile, on iOS and Android. Let, let's, talk, let's talk about some of the major milestones MC, like what, what's, what's Labs done this year? That's, that's a big deal. And then I think that'll be a good segue to talk about the work the foundation's done around V4. Mm -hmm. uh, so two big things. The first is um, trying to make Uniswap uh, a product that you can use on all platforms to be the best swapping platform. So that meant launching a mobile app on iOS and Android. It also meant really improving our web application so it feels more like a, a logged in experience, even though you still have self-custody portable account. Um, uh, with a self-custody wallet. Um, so we did a ton of work on uh, making this the swappy experience better, faster, uh, more data, um, sort of data-driven and having more data at your fingertips. That might seem quite simple, but because a lot of the past couple of years, um, many Web3 companies were excited about like the breadth of Web3. And so it was easy to have um, a lot of feature creep and scope creep. Um, we've been really focused on just narrowing in on that like swap product experience. The second thing we did was we did release a draft code base for V4 of the protocol. But since then, dozens of uh, community contributors have committed code to the protocol. And so um, we have not been doing go to market on V4, uh, the next version of the protocol that is really the foundation. And uh, our 2024, we'll be thinking about how we, alongside many other companies, um, uh, will be integrating um, V4 and the many pools and the breadth and diversity that that will um, bring into the front end products. Yeah, and on the um, foundation side, I think you know we I'm really proud of what we accomplished over over the last year. I could talk a lot about it. I'll, I'll highlight a few areas that I'm I'm most proud of, and I think are most representative of what we've done, and then touch a little bit on how we're thinking about the launch of, of V4. As MC mentioned, that's been a focus for us um, over the last year. You know, I've mentioned a few things. Um, uh, development, research, um, protocol, value accretion. And in terms of developers, we funded, you know, one of the first major alternative interfaces um, to the labs interface. And it, it speaks to, you know, a different kind of particular kind of like pro trader user. Um, and that's seen kind of a lot of like interesting traction thus far. Um, uh, in terms of research, we have launched a, a first of its kind DeFi focused research fellowship that will also result in a conference next year in New York in March. And I hope to see many of the folks in the room um, here or there as well. In terms of protocol value um, accretion, we've been working with Gauntlet, which many folks in, in the um, room may, may know is a really respected team in the space on thinking through um, or end publishing research around uh, dynamic fee optimization and different optimizations that other folks from a protocol or, or hook level may be able to leverage in the future. When it comes to V4, I think that the key paradigm shift here is the protocol is shifting from an immutable 
protocol to um, something that is still immutable but has a layer of customization, um, truly kind of a developer platform that allows for not only customization at the user interface application level, but also means the protocol can evolve and change over time in ways that it wasn't necessarily able to before. And from our perspective, three areas I'll call out that I'm really excited about are the um, seeding and supporting of hook platform, hook applications, automated liquidity management strategy, um, automated liquidity management hooks, custom oracles, uh, credit facilities, leveraging liquidity, um, hooks that speak to institutions um, in, in a way that the protocol hasn't really able to, been able to before, um, and um, improving the LP experience. And I think all of these represent inputs to positive flywheel on the protocol, adding that new organic order flow, as well as improving the LP and user uh, swapper experience. Just, just backing up a step. So Uniswap, when it first started, you know, automated market maker is what AMM stands for. Is this really, really simple kind of smart contract that you know that it had a very simple formula for trading tokens: X times Y equals K. That was, it's, you know, that, that probably means nothing to most folks in the audience. But in short, it, was, it it creates a really like you know simple curve on which tokens can trade. And the big innovation was um, there's always on liquidity for any pair of tokens that you want to trade. There doesn't need to be sort of a live counterparty in an order book to, to make it happen. And I used to describe this as sort of, you know, it's like a vending machine for tokens. You put you put the token in, um, you get a token out every time, and the price is the variable thing along this curve. So just backing up, you know, you're talking about hooks and, you know, how you can custom tune them. I think the, the, the high level, you know, evolution is that over time, Uniswap you know, which started very simple has gotten you know more complex, but are also more capable, right? And and the flexibility that hooks enable is um, you know more kind of parameterization, so you can have markets that are specially tuned to different types of use cases. For example, you know trade swapping you know stable coins um, of you know different types of stable coins can have one set of hooks that's uniquely well suited to that use case, which is a big one. And you know, then separately, there may be a different curve that makes sense for really long tail pairs, right? So that that's like the you know, when we talk about hooks, we're talking about customization of markets um, based on the use case, and and that's really exciting. If you have more customization, if it's a real platform, you know, the I think the thesis that we invested against can really truly be realized, and that thesis is that Uniswap becomes the venue. In, in you know where all the world's value can trade, and so if you believe all the world's value will be tokenized, you know hooks are really important innovation to make sure that Uniswap is the venue where where they can all trade. Um, so we we haven't talked about use cases a whole lot, but I think one you know I'm going to kind of go off the cuff here. You know I think stable coins remittances have been like there was a research report published about that use case and so i thought maybe we could talk a little about a bit about that cuz that's one area we're going to be talking about it more today how stable coins have real you know product market fit and are growing and uniswap's a big part of that story so MC, do you want to talk about? Yes, I'm really passionate about this use case. So I wrote a research paper with other with our research team at, um, at Uniswap about foreign exchange markets on um, automated market makers, so on, on Uniswap specifically. Um, and we just sort of looked at opportunities for both retail and remittances as well, uh, at retail uh, remittances, FX trading for retail, and then also um, uh, increased liquidity for other pairs that aren't just sort of the top uh, FX pairs. Um, I think you you nailed it in that like the an AMM demonstrated you could have always on liquidity and that anyone could create a market for anything using the form factor of a token on this platform, but uh, Uniswap v3 is still actually a specific market structure, right? It still actually specifies um, some of the major parameters. You have to be always on. You have total uh, exposure to volatility depending on the dynamics for that specific asset, and what v4 allows, as you described, is to be able to actually have market structure that's specific to a pool. And so what we hope we'll see is um, that that many more people who are starting to use uh, Uniswap um, and probably mostly the protocol uh, for all kinds of use cases that are popping up in crypto. So we are seeing more and more fintech companies starting to integrate stable coins and, and see that as an opportunity to have dollar access around the world. Um, and then also um, uh, some foreign exchange. There are more stable coins uh, popping up in different country in different um, currencies. Still not a ton of adoption outside USDC at USD, 
um, and the dollar stable coins. Um, but that's a use case that I'm extremely excited about. What does it mean for our products? Um, our users are those who are pretty savvy, hopefully some of you are in the audience, um, are pretty savvy and are co co comfortable with a self-custody wallet. Um, so that's part of why we're building an API that we can offer to fintech companies, for example, um, that might not that might want to have this under the hood, but not have um, their their whole experience be kind of feel like a self custody experience. Um, and then for our wallet itself, um, we're uh, actually building um, messaging and a few other pro few other features in the wallet that will make it more interactive. So things like transfers um, and have that more Venmo experience will feel more native um, on Uniswap. Great. Um, Okay, so I, th I guess um, you know what's what's what should people do in the audience if they wanna if they wanna get immersed in the ecosystem and the products? What what should people do? Well, I, I guess from from our perspective, we do a lot. Like the Uniswap Foundation is here to learn from you all, to teach you about Uniswap, to figure out how you can get more involved. Um, I guess first off. Love to chat here today, um, but you can also reach out to me, obviously, on, on Twitter, et cetera. Um, outside of that, we do a lot of IRL events for any hackers in the audience. We're at kind of every major ETH Global hackathon, and that's really ramping up with V4 on the horizon. Um, we've actually seen um, like all-time highs in the number of developer uh, submissions that we've gotten at hackathons because there's so much excitement around building around V4. Um, for those of you who are interested in contributing to governance who may not be hackers, we just kicked off um, IRL kind of governance and growth um, focused events, um, planning to have one in, in Dev Connect at Turkey and having some throughout the US next year. Um, yeah, th there's a lot of ways folks can, can plug in and excited to chat more about that. Download our wallet, please, please, please. It's the best, I promise. It's really the best swapping app um, out there. So, um, uh, and then you can always like uh, send us feedback through variant me directly or at Twitter, but, uh, but use our products. Great, okay, so Devin, MC, first just wanna say absolute pleasure working alongside both of you guys. I've learned so much from, from the two of you and you know, I think the ecosystem has as well. Uniswap is really sort of on the bleeding edge of pioneering lots of new ideas, lots of market structure concepts. And so it's, it's been a, a you know, thrill to be alongside for that. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone.